Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of In the Prog Seat. It's Tuesday night. Tonight, by popular demand, it's Guilty Pleasures Night. Okay, we've had a lot of people asking, Pete, what do you and the guys on In the Prog Seat listen to when you're not listening to prog rock or prog metal or fusion or heavy metal? What's that stuff that you maybe don't tell everybody that you really like that's kind of falls outside the realms of what we normally talk about on SOT. Uh, we've kind of done this sort of thing on the Hudson Valley Squares before. Uh, so you've heard me talk about mine, but I picked all different ones this time around. So we've got everybody else who's going to contribute their five guilty pleasures, we're going to call them, or off the beaten path artist, right? We've got in the house today from New York City, Chuck Alvarez. Greetings. From upstate New York, Eric Porter. From the great white north of Canada, Rick Labonte. All the way over from, from Scotland, it's like five o'clock in the morning his time, Mr. Stephen Reed. And we've got the Chicago connection flanking me on the top. We've got George Lemay and Louis Nasser. What's happening, everybody? Greetings. Nope. Greetings. Greetings. We're doing this. We're ready. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Let's let a toast to, to Ken Golden because it's his birthday. That's Happy right. Birthday. Happy birthday, Happy Ken. Birthday, Ken. Happy birthday, Ken. Birthday, Ken. Not with us tonight because he's probably making barbecue somewhere and enjoying a dinner with his lovely wife. So, Ken, yeah, this is for you. Oh, he's basically yeah, falling asleep at a show somewhere. I know, right? A toast to the professor. There we go. That's right. That's That's right. right. Mm -hmm. So uh, here's the order. We're basically going to go in the same order that I uh, introduced everybody. So since he hasn't been here uh, in a couple of weeks, Chuck Alvarez is going to go first, followed by Eric, followed by Rick, followed by Stephen, followed by George, and then Lewis, and then myself. And we'll go round and round until we get to our number ones or number fives, whatever it is. So, Chuck, what is your first guilty pleasure? My first, okay. My first, you know, you know I'm a big um, fan of music in general. But I didn't want to go too far off the beaten path and have people beaten down on uh, on you for the show and for my picks. But my first pick, my number five, is going to be Susie and the Banshees, Tinderbox. I've right. mentioned this before. You know, what's it? This is a band. Um, what's it? That was pretty much um, within the post punk realm. Uh, very influential band. You know, Susie Sue well, had an individual. Um, um, what's it? That nature of herself. Um, just she could just bring it, man. And um, what's a, when you talk about them, and so you also have to talk about their rhythm section. Budgie on drums, you can drum with anybody out there. Great drummer. Matter of fact, was an influence on Stuart Copeland. Mm -hmm. that's, how, that's how good of a damn um, bassist he is, I mean, drummer he is. Then you have the bass player, um, Steve Severin, another great bass player, um, plays the keyboards as well. And um, this album, this was one of two albums that um, John Carruthers, had played the guitar one after Robert Smith had left to go back to the cure. Man, my pick once again is Tinderbox, Susie and the Banshees. Cool. Right. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right, Eric Porter, you're up. Okay, well, my approach to this was just kind of going through my collection and looking and seeing one of these things doesn't belong, um, <laughs> you know, just kind of out of the realm, but this does have a prog connection. Mm -hmm. um, but this, these uh, these artists toured this summer. My sister saw them. I didn't go see them. I'm a sucker for pop. I'm a child of the '70s. Uh, I'm going with Hall and Oates. And um, really, kind of what got me back into them was watching Daryl's house and watching him play um, with all the different musicians. It just gave me a real appreciation for. He's another guy. He just loves music. I mean, he's had everything from country. ZZ Top, I think Billy Gibbons was on his show. I think he's a great songwriter, a great singer. He has a Fripp connection. Mm -hmm. um, I think Fripp had him on one of his records, if I, or Fripp would have produced one of his Explosion. records, if I'm not mistaken. But I'm a sucker. I love the whole Yacht Rock thing. That's what I grew up with. My parents had that stuff on the radio all the time. And 70s pop, for me, just connects. So I'm going with Hall & Oates. Nothing wrong with that. I love Hall Notes. Great, great songs are great songs, right? Yep. I know. And Chuck, I had to do a double take. I thought you were drinking like a bottle of ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> I looked down, I see this. <laughs> I was oh, like, what the hell is drinking? <laughs> well, uh, it's guilty pleasures. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, high fructose corn syrup and tomato paste. Woo. Drink a choice. <laughs> 
Oh. Uh, anyway, back to the music. Um, Rick, what do you got? Our center square tonight. Okay. Well, you know, uh, just like you guys said, uh, I love music. And so um, you don't feel guilty if you like something you like, right? But it's not something I would give as a homework assignment for this show, right? You wouldn't pass this to one of our pals here because it's so many things that kind of a... Unless you're Stephen Reed, that is. <laughs> maybe, I, I, maybe, I on the record. maybe I forgot about that episode. On the record, right? That howling Willie Cunt. No howling. <laughs> it's so amazing. Thank you, sir. I have not laughed so hard in a. That was like Shark TV. So, no. And and Simon's reaction to it. Yeah, yeah. 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 What a good sport. <laughs> yeah, he did not really well. <laughs> And I now have a new thing to say when people are confused and they don't know how to have a right face. Just say it with herpes. <laughs> Perfect. So thank you. Go ahead. So <laughs> anyway, I will follow that. Um, but no doubt, I mean, music is how what feelings sound like, right? And if it moved you and you like it, you like it, right? Well, in this case, this song is a, uh, I mean, this artist is more or less a genre that it's not something like we talk about prog, metal, or uh, even classic rock. If we talk about SOT, uh, we don't even talk about blues, but I love the blues. And I'm not going to include that because that's all part of our Zeppelin and our heritage of all the bands that we love. <laughs> but uh, we don't talk about reggae. And when I think about reggae, it's Bob Marley. And I do love listening to Bob Legend. Marley every now and then. I put on this uh, Legends album. And, and also because I love history and I like activism. And this guy was quite of the people uh, champion. And some of the messages he have, I get all pumped up. It's just like a hard rock song when you got get up, stand up, you know, stand up for you, right? It's like a marching song. I almost want to carry the banner. But it's so much uh, cool music. I mean, I'm not the one to go follow the whole genre. Uh, Peter Tosh and all kinds of, uh, I'm sure they're great talent, but he did that face of that music. And and I'm, again, it's depending on how I feel, just like uh, um, it's usually in the summertime, you know, just like when I listen to Steve Miller or the Beach Boys, you don't think about that in January and February. But when you're thinking about the warm weather or something like that, reggae works, right? Uh, but there's, there's some timeless material. And I think that, that's what moved me about this. Like Redemption Song is a history right in that one, three, four minutes. And it hit me all the time. I'm getting chilled just thinking about it. But anyway, Bob Marley, folks. Uh, he's not something that everybody uh, hear about in this channel. But this guy is a true songwriter and had a message. You know, just like when you think about Roger Waters, he's an activist. He puts it out through his music, his side point of view. Uh, other artists, John Lennon, Power to the People, Imagine. Bob Miley did it in his way. And I think it, it works with me. Show of hands, everybody here and everybody watching uh, at home. How many people own that CD he just showed? <laughs> <That would too. laughs> he was like, no, nah, don't be in this house, man. <laughs> Eric, I'm surprised. George, I know you wouldn't have it, but Eric, I'm surprised. Yeah, no reggae for me. No, that's like the only the only reggae I will listen to is Bob Marley. Yeah, what I got right here is what I showed you. But you know what? I like it. It, it is off beat and pass. Great, great songs, man. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, no, I'm a big reggae fan as well. But uh, um, I, I yeah. definitely go for some Peter Tosh as well, man. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Gregory Isaacs. I can go on with reggae, man. There's right a lot on. Of that's cool. Out there. Mm -hmm. I didn't explore that much, but he's the guy for me so far. Nice. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Reed, what do you got? Well, I can get on with most things, but I can't get on with reggae, but we all like different things. That's the whole point of this show. Yeah. Now, I'm going to start quite soft here, and then everyone's got very credible artists here. I'm frightened that I've gone all in at the end, but we'll find out as we go if it's only me that's gone all in at the end, but I definitely have, I think. So I'm going to start off with Simon oh, and Garfunkel. Beautiful. Mm. That's where I'm going. That's where I'm starting off. <laughs> I've got a lovely box set that's got all of these beautiful albums yep. in them. Um, and if ever you're looking for crafted music with fantastic vocals, lyrics that often have an awful lot to say, then you can do an awful lot worse than really anything out of the Simon and Garfunkel catalogue. Mm -hmm. I can listen to them all day long, but especially in a night, lights off, headphones on. And you've got stuff like Mrs. Robinson, Scarborough Fair. You know, you've got things like The Boxer, which is a bit more upbeat. Sound of um, Silence. 
Oh, I, I love that. That <laughs> song's so beautiful. Everything the harmonies. And this live performance, when they got back together and clearly still didn't get on at all, yeah. is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's it's brilliant. <laughs> I like the whole catalogue. I like everything that they put out, really. And, and there are a few moments where mm, you think, yeah, okay, everyone does that, though. But th that catalogue is ridiculously strong, and it stands up now as if it's brand new. So Simon and Garfunkel are my first pick. And you yeah, know, Steve, and they talk about his songwriting. <coughs> he's a he's a good guitar player. I mean, if you listen to his finger picking and everything else, oh yeah, nobody ever talks about Paul Simon as a guitar player, and it's and a, and a great bass. Some too. intricate stuff there. It's yeah. and a, a great guy. arranger. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, per yeah, beautiful songs. Yep. Yeah, yeah. great stuff. Um, yeah, you mentioned all the the best uh, the best one, but it's so many. Like uh, it's oh, hard. Yeah. Like I got the greatest hits because it's uh, something I can take with me, but I know there's several great albums. You wouldn't be disappointed to get in deeper. It just got more, uh, uh, what you call it, political statements of some yeah. sort. Steven, is that a live one? Is that the Central Park one? Yeah. At the bridge under, okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, you get Central Park one. Ooh, Steven, yeah. I don't know. It's live at Central Park. That's a great DVD. Yeah. yeah, I've seen the show, but it's a DVD that's in the box. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, it's just really good. It was just a good way to get them all. I've got a few other ones or a few of these already on vinyl, but it was just a nice way to get them all in one go. Right on. Good choice. Isn't it amazing how they sing like that live too, buddy? Oh, it's just yeah, like the, It's just like the Everly Brothers, right? The Phil and, and Don were able to come to one microphone and they know the placement where they can get that beautiful harmony every time. It's yeah, amazing. It's two voices yeah. that were made to be together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Too bad they can't stand each other, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's just like Phil and Don, too, everywhere. Too. They had to have their trouble. Oh, well. All right, George. I'm, I'm really curious to see what George yeah. picked for yeah. today. I want to hear this. Uh, my number five is a funk band based out of New York called Screaming Headless Torsos. Nice. Right. Uh, it's a funk band, but... I guess the twist is that these guys are all jazzers. Uh, the guitar player, Dave Fushinsky, he's a Berkeley jazz instructor. Uh, Jojo Meyer, the drummer, he's a uh, clinician of the highest order. The bass player, Fima Efron, was in the fusion band Lost Tribe. So they really know how to work a groove. This shit grooves really hard. Um, this is from 95, but they're still going today. They work really slow. They got four albums and, and all that time. But, um, yeah, if you like funk at all, but maybe think normal, a lot of the funk that you hear is a little cheesy. This is a, a low dairy product. This is just hard grooves. Yeah. <laughs> Screaming. Right on. That's a good one. I have that one. That's that's the only one I have, actually. That's that's good stuff. It's the best of them. But yeah. yeah. Cool. cool. I got uh, Anthony's picks. You want to <laughs> tell me the same at the end or as we go? Uh, do his right now. OK, his number five is the self-titled from Flock of Seagulls. Oh, oh, yeah, nice. He's got right. some interesting picks here. I can imagine. <laughs> wow, awesome. Very cool. Very cool. I'll remember that one. Flock of seagulls. <laughs> All, right, like yeah. mm -hmm. All right, Lewis. Oh, what do you got? All right. So for me, I just to clarify, like everybody said, I don't really have guilty pleasures because I don't give a shit if people don't like what I like. I don't, I don't care. I couldn't possibly care less, right? But um, so I'm just gonna start. Hard and Heavy was something that I'm pretty sure nobody would expect. I first heard this record when I was a kid. I was in Toronto for, for this weird camp. And I heard it and I fell in love with it. And when I came home, I saved my money to buy it. I'm talking about the B-52s. Love it. Beautiful. This record is fucking awesome. I don't love it. it. I, I love it. It's Not just a single on. bad song on it. Yes, that, that's exactly right. It's, it just plays right through, and it's all killer. No filler, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. So this is... I, is that I think the Love Shack? Love Shack? No, no this is... Um, way before. It kicks oh, way off with Claire. It's got Rock Lobster. But then it's got a song called There's a Moon in the Sky, and it's called The Moon. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's just... Uh, this is, I, I love this record. I have no, no, other, no other way to describe it. It's, it's, uh, it's about as far away from Prague or fusion or metal as you can get but i fucking love it so b52's debut excellent great cool. album yep all right so uh i don't really know what you call this guy funk r&b pop 
rock. He's a great guitar player, kind of a misunderstood artist, I think. But uh, I have, I think, pretty much everything he's ever done. And I don't like all of his albums. I like some a lot and some I just bought because it's him. And uh, I sometimes wish he would just like do like all guitar albums because the guy is an insanely talented guitar player. He's no longer with us. Uh, and I just happened to pick one of the records. Uh, it's the mo most well-known one. But uh, Mr. Prince. Yes, Purple Rain. Purple Rain. <laughs> Uh, I really dig the early part of the catalog. I like a lot of the latter part too, but it's just so weird. He just, he went off in some really weird directions, but great, great artist, great songwriter, great singer. I saw him live once. What a great entertainer. And, uh, you know, but another one of those like tortured artists, so to speak. Right. And, uh, but man, I, we, we all miss him and uh, he left us way too early, but yeah, I, every now and then we'll throw on print CDs and be like, ah, cool. Yeah. I, that guy so he's a great guitar player too man have you, have you guys oh, yeah. 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 well my guitar gently weeps so oh, like all-star jam he, oh and yeah kicking everyone's ass hard yeah and but that guy does it all like he jane brown michael jackson jimmy Hendrix, all in the one man like that guy can do the splits he can do the dance he can do the voice i mean he's it's just an amazing talent and yeah it'd be uh that album especially is timeless, right? Yeah. And you can get the full dose almost. And didn't Miles Davis even hooked up with him too, right? Before he passed away, didn't they do something together? They or at least they might have. Yeah, they might have. Okay, I thought I heard that, but so, but a great artist, love him. Yeah, love him. All right, Chuck, back to you. All right. Well, um, you know. This um, group over here is going to bring up a couple of chuckles between um, you, Pete, and George um, from an email that you um, had gotten. Um, my number four is OK Computer from Radiohead. I love Radiohead, period. There isn't anything from the band outside of the first album that I don't love. And um, what's it, I'm just one of these guys that's a sucker for this band. Um, you know, this is the band that, oh, what's what, that a lot of progressive rockers also say that, you know, that this was their foray into progressive rock. And this is their third album um, from 1977. I got it. 1997, forgive me. 1997, no, OK Computer, Radiohead. Well, yeah, I mean, a, lot of the, a lot of the young people love them quite a bit. Tony Banks uh, mentioned that his children were into, he thought that they were, that he was, that when he first heard a few songs off of here, he thought that his children had went into his um, stash and was listening to his samples. <laughs> so, and then, when, then he found out it was Radiohead, but he likes Radiohead as well, surprisingly. <laughs> so did Mike Portnoy. He liked yes. those two yeah. albums yeah, back mean, to back. He yeah. also calls them like a Revolver and Stars and Pepper mm -hmm. comparison because he, they really advanced progressively one album apart. Nice. I sometimes feel like I'm I'm like the one person who just doesn't seem to get that band for whatever reason. Well, there's quite a few. Hey, people. you were slow on the King's Act and you came around. So who knows? There's time on you. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know what? Sometimes it doesn't hit everybody right away. Hit, you know. Yeah, I mean, you can't like everything, right? It's, That's true, too. Gonna happen. <laughs> All right, Eric, what do you got? All right, you guys might want to get the cheese out for this one. I really, I only <laughs> own one album. I can't explain why other than when I heard the guitars, I fell in love with the guitars. This kind of crosses into hard rock. Um, and I, I get totally cheesy and everything else, but I, I love the guitars. And actually when I bought the record, I like most of the record. So don't hate me. I'm going with the darkness, um, hmm. permission to land. <laughs> and I get it. And I, I'm waiting for the comments to come in. But if you listen to that record, the guitars are on fire on that record. There's mm -hmm. some great riffs and great playing. And I get the whole bad side of it, but I dig the record. So that's my number four. Nice. Guitar Hack is watching. He's like, yes. <laughs> Derek, you should, you should look on YouTube for the um, heavies videos and premiere guitar for the rig rundown. Okay. And they, they do one in the darkness. It is, I, even if you don't like the band, the, you, you will like them after you see that video just for the entertainment value of how they explain their rig. Cool. I'll they look for really that. really cool cats. So I, and, I, and again, who, who cares, right? You dig it, you dig yeah. it. 
And the it's company, the only one it's I ever better. bought. It's, it's even better if people are judging, right? Because then you can have it. Exactly. Laugh. It's fun. Good. <laughs> going, going back to a previous discussion that we've had on the show, they've got a brand new song out, which I can't quite remember the name of it, but it's something along the lines of I love Glasgow, believe it or not. <laughs> and it is spelled G I E, Glasgow. And honestly, the amount of tweets I've had from people who've gone, who are from Glasgow, who've gone, what is this shit? What is this all about? <laughs> oh, there you go. I just. Funny how it's relevant to what we spoke about weeks ago. <laughs> right. Glasgow. It's also utter crap, but that's not the point. That album actually is quite good. Mm-hmm. Oh, it is. It's a very good album. Well, we might have to make a new SOT shirt. It's like, you say it Glasgow, however you want to say it, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to Rick. Okay, so uh, since he mentioned uh, Simon and Garfunkel, I'm going to pick something similar uh, because it's about the vocal. Uh, just hearing the harmonies. And again, this wouldn't be a homework assignment I would give to of my pals on the these shows. Uh, I couldn't recommend this to Chris Allo, but Mama and the Poppers, uh, the, you know, mm-hmm. the double album, Gold, and you, you know, say what you want. It's sugary, it's poppy, it's uh, groovy, it's hippie, it's all those things, but it's also ear candy when you listen to vocals. Everything I love about the, the Beach Boys and the Beatles of the period where you just vocally chime, these people do it. And so uh, I know they do covers. I know they have written some stuff. I know, uh, but like, you know, I don't got the whole collection, but a double album every now and then when I want to get that, you know, sunny side up kind of vibe on a Sunday morning, this is it. You know, it's a good, perfect, you know, kind of like, the, uh, I don't know, just, just, just a good... <laughs> lift you up feeling good you know feeling groovy if you will so mama's in a poppers i love the vocal hey they get props for me just for california dream and one of the great yep. kind of uh oh monday monday too i mean yeah some great songs from the 60s right yeah yes. cool Excellent. timeless all right steven you're up well on the theme of wonderful vocals i'm gonna bring it a little more up to date i do love <laughs> a pop hook I do love harmony vocals, and I absolutely love this album. I love this album by the Bangles. Well, I love it too. It's just okay. a stupendous album. Okay, so this is different light, and this is rammed with hits. Do you know you do have Manic Monday on here? You've got In a Different Light, Walking Down Your Street, Walk Like an Egyptian. I mean, we've all heard that too much. It's an okay song though. You've got Standing in the Hallway. I mean, the first side of this album alone. It's just ridiculously good, but it just isn't let down by anything. If she knew what she wants, put a vocal on that. I really, it's an album I go back to a lot and I can listen to it start to finish and then go back and start it again. I don't think they kind of came near to this after, you know, and they arguably became bigger after this album, but this album for me is just ridiculously good. So yeah, the bangles, still love them. No argument there. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Great vocal. All right, George. Okay. My number four, uh, the listed genre is Flamenco Nuevo. It's a collaboration album. Rodrigo and e. Gabriela. Oh. In Cuba. They're Mexicans. I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I'm familiar with them. Yeah. They're a couple of acoustic players, not authentic flamenco players. They, I mean, they don't, they don't play with their fingers. They're pick players, I believe. Um, they got a bunch of albums as an acoustic duo, which I don't really pay attention to, but they added this, this Cuba thing, which is basically a, a makeshift orchestra of strings and horns, uh, a lot of cu- Cuban the big hits, their soloing, um, <coughs> super interesting. Uh, the material is all their greatest hits, basically re-recorded with this Cuba lineup. Uh, I just find the whole thing, I, I spun the crap out of this in 2012 when it came out. It's just super infectious, really good production. If you like the a lot of big strings and horn hits and flamenco flavors, Latin stuff, really, really good. Yeah. I think Gabriela is, um, <laughs> he uses a guitar more percussively when they do yeah. the duo thing. And Rodrigo is the guy who's playing more of the melody lines and the, and the leads. But yeah, they're, they're, they're very good. 
I, I think they're good players in their own way. They 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 carved the niche for themselves. I think they started playing Metallica covers, either Orion, some yeah. things like that, and then they just built it from there. Yeah, they got a little following. Yeah. Oh yeah, not that little. I mean, uh, Anthony yeah. has here, no doubt, rock steady. I love that <laughs> album. I like it too. Cool. All right, back to Lewis. All right. Now we're going to talk about a record that I think everybody was sure would never be mentioned on this channel. But I think that it needs to be mentioned because I, I've always thought it's a brilliant record ever since I heard it. And I am talking, of course, of an American artist called Kendrick Lamar. Yes. And the album is called <laughs> Pimp a Butterfly. And it's uh, this, this record right here. A 10. Great a, 10. a 10 is not an exaggeration. Mm -hmm. and, and I will add something to every prog snob that I've ever had the displeasure of talking to. <laughs> I will say that if you leave your prejudice in your underwear drawer and actually listen to this and understand the rhythmic structures that are being laid out for you and the way that this guy uses rhythm and the bass frequencies and the keyboards, with real drums in addition to some electronic stuff. It is a master class in counterpoint. I can tell you this truly as somebody who loves to study music and who plays complex stuff for fun. This guy is not a clown. He is truly a, a great artist. And this happens to be my favorite only because that was the first one I got and I just fell in love with it. But if you listen to some of his other records, they're brilliant too. Mad City. Mad City. Kendrick Lamar. The pimp a butterfly. So, how would you classify his his music? Because I'm not familiar with it's, it. It's 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 rap. It's hip hop. Oh, okay. But it's 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 very high level hip hop. And and like we were talking about some of these activists, you know, his lyrics are very meaningful. They're not really, you know, I have a gun and and, and six thousand hoes and I'm going to be the, the the king of the, this block, right? He's talking about very important things. Um. So I think um, it's, it's not the usual thing for most people who will come to this channel. Um, but I would say this, this is a really, and it's unusual because it does use actual musicians. It doesn't use just, you know, cut and paste collage of samples. Although there are samples, but it's, it's, it's very well done. And I am a big fan of this guy. I think he's, uh, he's, he's as good as, as you might expect, you know? So, and, and more. I think he's much better than most people would expect, in fact. But, he, but once you know that he's good, you realize he's got a lot of things to offer. So I love this record, The Pimp a Butterfly. I would say if you want to take a chance with something that's really outside your wheelhouse, you could do far worse with a lot of choices. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I dig this record a lot. Great Ooh. album. That's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I think someone else, maybe it was Eric, mentioned uh, Yacht Rock, right? Um, I also like quite a bit of Yacht Rock, as we're going to see over the next little bit, um, <laughs> including this guy and this debut album, which I think is absolutely terrific. And it sold a shit ton of records. And I know most like rockers hear this guy's name. And they're like, oh, you know, Kenny G. With no, 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 not quite going to go there. Um, da, 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 Christopher Cross. Okay. This is a really great album. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we, most of these songs got, you know, played big time on the radio. Uh, you know, Never Be the Same, Say You'll Be Mine, uh, Sailing, you know, which was the more schmaltzy songs. But man, Ride Like the Wind. That's such yeah. a great tune. That rock. Mm -hmm. And what a what a great guitar solo there. You got, you know, Eric Johnson plays on this album too. Uh, this is just good pop music from you know late 70s, early 80s. What year did this come out? 79, 80, something like that. Um, expertly produced. The vocals are just spot on. Yeah, it's sugary sweet and everything nice, but uh, who cares? Good stuff, lots of good flavors on here. And you know, the good thing about this album is that the deep tracks are pretty damn good. You know, we're all kind of tired of the hits, but uh, yeah, this is just a really good, fun album. I'm not ashamed to say I like it, and I listen to this every so often. Excellent. Did we not go through a period as well where it was mandatory for every rock band to try and cover one of his songs? Yeah. Ah, mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many cover versions of his music, it's unbelievable. And even yeah. Saxon have done Christopher Cross, and you think, really? Oh, really? That's funny. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
they did their Like the Wind, awesome, yeah, they did, on Destiny, their EOR album, which I quite like, didn't bring it for tonight, could have done. <laughs> <laughs> but think about it, it's 40 years later, and you hit, you can hear those song melodies in your head, and you can probably sing half the words, if not all of them, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. What does that mean? It makes it timeless. Yeah, it's timeless. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, Chuck, back to you. All right. Kudos once again to Brother Lewis for uh, putting something out there, out the norm and so, as, I, as many would know that I'm also a big hip hop fan, but didn't want to bring anything like that into this, um, which to this stage at the time. And so um, my number three is from a young lady um, what's a, who celebrated her birthday today, actually. Um, today's her birthday. Um, Bjork, her debut album. You know, what's a, that? Um, I love Bjork. You know, what's a, I loved her stuff with the Sugar Cubes. And what's a, her solo stuff just happens to transcend everything from that point onward. It's like listening to a freaked out version of, uh, what's a, of uh, Kate Bush and Peter Gabriel. And Prince, you know, what's a, she's just amazing. Um, her her debut album, actually, it's technically not her debut album. She actually did an album when she was, I think, 12 years old in 1977. And um, a, this was her first proper release over here. So it's technically her second album. But the name of the album is Bjork and its debut. Um, Human Behavior, you know, what's a, when that album, I mean, when that song first came out, you saw the video all over the place. And, um, you know, this is just the time this album, you know, what's a, she, um, I noticed she said that she listed Prince as a, as a huge influence on her. So, and you could hear it on certain songs on this album. Um, Venus as a boy, um, you know, there's more than life to them than, than this. You know, it's just so many um, spectacular songs. A phenomenal debut, Bjork. Can I add one thing for the, the, the music geeks who watch this show? Mm -hmm. You may think that Bjork is a lesser human. Mm -hmm. I would invite them to to listen to a song by her by her called "Army of Me." Beautiful. It is a Beautiful. song which is all in Dorian, mm -hmm. Dorian mode. The one the the it, it just it, it 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 not Dorian the 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 seventh degree of the scale, mm -hmm. the one that is supposed to be unusable, right? Dor Dorian. Mm -hmm. It's it it is really it mm -hmm. is really amazing what she does with the song, mm -hmm. and I I would just say please. Um, listen to it and, and, and try to, to absorb what she's doing with the melody and that little synth bass riff. This is really, really high level composing, truly. Mm -hmm. So just saying, you know, you, you tend to think, ah, Bjork, you know, she's quirky. No, no, she, she's doing some cool shit. You mm -hmm. know, she really is. So. I mean, she was quirky, but Locrian, sorry, Locrian. It's all Locrian. Locrian, okay. 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 Locrian mode, all of it. Not Dorian, Locri. Right. That's the, that's the word I was forgetting. Sorry, but that's 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 what it is. It's it's really amazing. So she's a massively diverse artist. Yes, and her vocal range and power is incredible. That's what I've always taken away from her work. It's just what a vocal talent, and then you add everything else to that. Incredible. Yes, he's amazing, man. Good stuff. All right, Eric, back to you. Well, I'm going back to the 70s, and this is just kind of a simple one for me. It reminds me of my father. Um, my father used to have a little radio out in the garage when he'd be out there tinkering around. And I remember getting him a cassette player for his birthday or something. So he had his cassette player out there. And this is somebody he always listened to. And I guess it just got in my head, just working with my dad and hanging with my dad when I was a kid, Jim Croce. Um, oh. Just some really cool songs. And again, another one, like we were talking about Paul Simon, there's some really cool guitar parts in there and just chording. And I think it was him and another guy who did most of the guitar stuff. Um, and again, it's just memories of my dad and it just sticks with me. Um, so that's my number three. I think he did stuff with Ron Carter. I think Ron Carter worked with him as well. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, a, that's a name I just don't know at all. I don't, I don't oh, know. Really? Jim he had some big hits uh, way back when. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. At least here, anyway. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if he's done anything over here, but most totally likely he did. didn't. So he was very popular, but he died so young. Yeah, you know, he yeah. died very young. Okay. Cool. All right, back to our center square. Mr. Okay. Um, uh, this one was uh, obviously um, it went through channel to discover this artist. He's a genius, and you guys are gonna not gonna disagree. Uh, just like uh, your 
genius uh, print. I'm talking about uh, Stevie Wonder and oh, uh, yes. talking mm -hmm. book or mm -hmm. this one. But let me tell you how it, how I discovered Stevie. And you would think because Detroit, that was easy, the Motown stuff. Mm -hmm. I've heard it, didn't know little Stevie was playing a lot of that stuff. But it was in 1982, I was 12 years old. And when you were getting your allowance and you were buying records, um, you had to make sure you spend your hard earned money. I had to test these records and I would go to the library and get these records. And one of them was that Paul McCartney had tug of war mm -hmm. on it in 82. And, uh, and TV wonder is a guest on that album. And of course, you know, the timeless song, Ebony and Ivory, mm -hmm. I was blown away. I loved it. Not only was so awesome and George Martin produced that, but as he thought metaphorically, and I was a pretty advanced kid, right, to think that was pretty progressive. And as I loved the song more as the years went on, uh, thinking the whole irony of, you know, Ebony and Ivory, the keyboard, making beautiful harmony, black and white on the same key piano. What a great metaphor. And I'm thinking Paul pretty deep, but, and John Lennon's a deep thinker, but Stevie Wonder that deep like that. It just got my curiosity going what about it? In the same library, if you keep looking, you see this record there. And it's kind of like a greatest hit of the time, a double album of uh, of Stevie Wonder up to date. But then ultimately I would buy Talk and Book with a later discover Jeff Beck is on it, one of my heroes. So that was a happy accident. But I mean, but it was the Ebony and Ivory that got my curiosity. And then you saw the video, that was the age of video starting to come out and I dig the video. So I went and got this record I, uh, from the library. And then I thought, I think it's great. I went and bought this one after when I, with my own allowance, uh, knowing that uh, I just was really drawn to it. Now, what's on there, Stevie Wonder, of course, superstition and a great, great, a lot of popular songs that you would know if you were alive at then as a teenager or whatever. But for a 12 year old, this was new discovery. And I just love the groove. And I love that I learned that he played a lot of these instruments, the bass, the drum, the wood block, the harmonica, all these things. And then to find out the guy had a disability that like, you just respect him that much more. The more I digged into learning about this guy, the more I, 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 I loved him. And so Needless to say, and it's no guilty pleasure. I went and saw Stevie Wonder when I can. It was that winter, uh, Caesar Winter, and I got to see this legend doing all these songs that I've heard when I was a kid. So it's Stevie Wonder for me. Inner visions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Songs of the key of life. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, amazing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. You can go on with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Great stuff. All right, Stephen, back to you. Well, this might be where I start to kind of push things off the edge of the cliff now. <laughs> from here on in, I've, got, I've gone guilty pleasures. <laughs> That's where I've gone, okay? So when I first heard this artist, I kind of thought, it's watered down soul, it's watered down funk, it's watered down rock. And it took a little while for me to quite like introducing the hard line by Terrence Trent mm -hmm. Darby. Okay, this is a fantastic mm -hmm. debut album. Yep. It's got real depth, real great performances. He's a great performer. But it took me years to get into this, to the extent that by the time that I did, he had already put out his second album, Neither Fish Nor Flesh, which is just a ridiculous album for a guy who was a chart act. Do you know, he was having number one hits and was all, all over the place on the television. And this is a daring record that is, you know, quite wide and varied in, in what it brings. There's no hit on it. There's no real hooks on it. It's just an experimental album by a guy that was huge at the time. And everyone hated it. I quite like it. It, it maybe deserves a place on this show. By the time that I got into him, he was doing his Symphony or Dam album. Okay. And th this to me is just utterly fantastic. It's his just so album. good. Yeah, it is his best album by quite some distance. I mean, you've got things like She Kissed Me on there, uh, Do You Love Me Like You Say, which is, oh, what a groove on that. Then there's Delicate, which was a, a duet, which is just gorgeous and glorious. And I actually went to see TTD on this tour um, back in 1993. He was outstanding. His band were every bit the match for him. They could all sing. They did a couple of songs a cappella. The level of musicianship on stage was just off the charts, and it was just immense. 
It also gave me one of the most cringeworthy moments I've ever seen <laughs> at a live show. Terms sitting down at his piano, just ready to play in the moment, and someone shouts from the Glasgow Barrel Land, We love you, Terry. And he stops the band and goes, Thank you. And just eases <laughs> back and starts at the top. Oh, 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 <laughs> so cringeworthy that it's, oh, I won't sleep tonight after thinking that from there. And then he released the subtly titled Vibrator which is, yet again, he goes from a phenomenal album to one where you kind of think, well, do you know, he's putting it all out there, mm. put some of it back. Yeah, and that a week. It, it verges on graphic in places. It's a bit odd. And then in nine, uh, 2001, he actually becomes Sananda Matria, um, changes everything about him and goes off in a completely different direction. The music is similar-ish. There are some good hooks and, and some good songs on here. I haven't investigated any further than that, but I love Terms Trend Derby. There you go. Nice. Mm -hmm. Very cool. He's, Stephen, was he popular for, because from what I remember, I, that first album came out in the 80s and then he kind of fell off the face of the earth here, I think. I don't mm -hmm. remember ever well, hearing about him. Yeah, this album was that, enormous in that, the UK yes. and it was big mm -hmm. in the US, but neither fish nor flesh, if I think that's what it's called. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this just killed everything Stone Dead because okay. there's not a single on here. There's not a hook on here. There's nothing you can sing. That, but it was intentional. Well, it was hard to pigeonhole them. You know, so what's yeah. a, well on R and B stations? They still played him quite a bit. But um, as far as his crossover, um, he started. He didn't cross over as much after um, his um, debut album. What's a, but he's had some pretty good ones, but he also had a, a few stinkers on there too. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I mean, I can listen to this now, but this is hard work. Mm -hmm. It's hard work, and Vibrator has some great songs on it, but it just seems to be one of those albums where it was started with a strange idea and taken further. Uh, and for a guy who was, I mean, the album before, same again, he had, he had massive hits and he, he was on the radio, he was on the television, mm -hmm. and it almost seemed like he was one of those artists that thought, oh, success, no thanks. Okay. You know, and just as soon as he kind of got into a groove where people thought, oh, he's back, it's him, it's brilliant, he would go, no, no, I'll have to do something way over here now. So, mm -hmm. self-destruct half the time, but yeah, we've seen, great stuff too. <laughs> we've seen a lot of that. A lot of artists mm -hmm. do that, yeah. All right, cool. All right, back to George. My number three is a uh, alternative rock band. They're often derided because they committed the cardinal sin of getting popular, really popular for a few oh, years. Fuck, what are they doing? Talking about Incubus. Ooh, wow. Love it. Yeah. Saw them live for that tour. This, yeah, this is before the album before they got popular. Um, yeah, the tour I saw the tour too. This was they headlined and the System of a Down opened like two bands that were going to blow up a few months after this. This is not like the radio stuff. It's uh, heavy. It's funky. The rhythm section is slamming. The singer is a Mike Patton sound alike, but not as uh, charismatic, obviously, not with the wild stuff, but the physical voice sounds like him. Just a bunch of really well-written stuff. And uh, uh, it's probably the last band I got turned on to by FM radio. I, I can't think of one since then, but... Uh, yeah, they got played on a local station here, and I just went out and got it. That within a couple of days, I was, that's how it struck me. So, if you got an open mind to check it out, despite the name, check this album out. <laughs> that's a great album. I haven't listened to that in years, but that's yeah, a great. Yeah, album. I saw, saw them live for that tour. They were they were damn good, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anthony has Madonna, Ray of Light. Mm -hmm. a, a nice version, cover version of it. Mm -hmm. I love Madonna, so. <laughs> I never had an issue with Madonna either. So I know many people do not like her, but well. I've never <laughs> met her, but her music is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lewis, I guess you'll go next. I uh, just want you to know, I, 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 I'm not sure if I've forgiven you yet for your kiss comment on Facebook yesterday. Wow. Oh, well. I, I, I am I am an expert at pissing off KISS fans. I'm um, sure. <laughs> uh, for, for many, many years, I played in a band called Kurgan's Bane, and, and my, my brother and, and very dear friend Jeff Laramie tried to win me over. And his technique consisted in whenever we were on the road, he would play nothing but KISS records for me. 
The third backfired spectacularly, <laughs> especially when he played records like The Elder. Oh, it was fantastic. <laughs> and, um, and he played, um, he played, he played a lot of records. My problem with Kiss, and this is just a me problem particularly, is that I think that the best thing they ever did was that book. Because that lays out the brand for what it is, and it's a very good read. I really admire their 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 their, their thoughts and how they market themselves. But but um, I don't I don't I can't think of another band that would sell you a coffin with their logo. <laughs> that also serves as a refrigerator for beer. Mm-hmm. Oh, that lies my problem. Other than how, right? You know. <laughs> If if I I had had a light right on a coffin, hotter than hell. You're going. Right. If you I, buy the coffin, at least you get to use it for a few few yeah, years. I mean, before well, you, you don't, know. but somebody else does. <laughs> but, you know. Well, if uh, I had better yeah, lighting in no, here. So, so you know, I just I, see, I tried. In here, Lewis, in here, if I had better lighting, you would see the Peter Chris book, the Gene Simmons book, the Paul Stanley book, the Ace Freely book. I've got a book on Eric Carr. There you go. I quite like this. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and that's the thing. And, like, and also, my first encounter with Kiss as a kid was with a song that was playing on Mexican radio. And, and you all should know that in Mexico, there are, there are three bands that have godlike status. Iron Maiden, One, The Doors, and two. Kiss. Godlike status. They are untouchable. So me being an anti-kiss guy, I have the scars to prove that I stood my ground. It's not an easy task. But my first point of entry was a song called I Was Made for Loving You, Baby. Followed by Charisma. And I was done. That was just me, right? So, I, you know. That was the wrong entry point, Louis. Wow, that is my Later, I saw charisma. That's right. What is my, what is my. Of, the, of the legendary Carol Kay attempting to give Gene Simmons a bass lesson. If you haven't watched it, I mm-hmm. highly recommend you do. Yeah, it's funny. So it's there we hilarious. go. Mm-hmm. All right. So, all right. but this is just like you, like we've always said, we can't all like everything. That's yeah. right. Cool. Mm-hmm. All right, my next choice is a band that I missed when they first hit. And, and I, I think I dismissed them just for the band name. And I, that was at the time when I was very much into just metal and prog and things. And I, I heard the band name and I thought, well, that's very apt. And I didn't really listen to them much. But in recent years, um, and many people through the years have tried to convince me to give them a shot. And I was always very like, nah, nah. But I heard them on NPR not too long ago. They were doing an interview and they were, they were promoting their latest record. And, you know, I think timing is everything. When I heard that new record, it suddenly really hit me. Like, okay, this, this, this is really interesting. So now I, I, am a, I am a diehard fan. And I also need to, to send out apologies to two Sono Sombra members, um, Rich Poston and... Um, Mara, who's our merch lady, because they're always telling me I should dig them, that they thought I would like them, and I always I wasn't really into it. And um, I am talking, of course, about the band Garbage. Love them. Mm-hmm. And this is their latest album, mm-hmm. No Gods, No Masters. And this is a really, really good record. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, it's kind of, a, I don't know what you would call it, alternative rock, rock, I don't know. But it's not prog, fusion, metal. There's none of these things. But I, I discovered, I really... I dig these guys, you know, that the singer is brilliant. Um, Butch Vig on drums and whatever he does else is, is really good. It just works. It really works. So I worked my way backwards and now I have all their albums and I really, really like them. But Garbage is my number three. Nice. Mm-hmm. Cool. I like that purple on that cover. That's... Yeah, it's, it's really cool. That the, you know, you have a, you can see a shot of the band here. She is a greatly entertaining human being. If, if you can yeah. catch a YouTube video of her with Craig Ferguson, it's a great, great, great laugh. Right, it's a very good time. Shirley Monson. Yeah, yeah she's Shirley is awesome. And, and, uh, I believe she's she's also Scottish. Yes. Yes, she is indeed. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So, so I I, I very much appreciate her humor. This is something that I this is what I appreciate about you. Half the things you say, people just go by their heads, but I'm laughing on the entire time. It's hilarious. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's the thing. Um, garbage. Cool. Nice. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of stay in yacht rock territory a bit here. Um, baby, come back. Mm-hmm. 
player. No player action. Player. And, you know, the funny thing is, you know, that's like their, I think they had maybe one other minor hit. That's like their big major hit. Uh, and everybody kind of judges them on that song. It's a great song. It, it really is. But, man, this album kicks ass. This is like um, kind of like the Doobie Brothers of the same era on steroids, like Ambrosia. I mean, musically, these guys were really good. There's really good guitar playing on here, nice keyboards. The hooks are all over the place. And it's actually, you know, most people just write this off as just like this bland pop album. It's really not. And most of the player catalog is pretty seriously good. Uh, these guys were just some, you know, really, really good songwriters, really talented players. I mean, Melanie's a great pop song on here. Every Which Way, Goodbye is a great tune. Come on out. Uh, trying to write a hit song. Love is where you find it. Great, great stuff. Really good production. Just good, slick, like late 70s pop rock with some hard rock tendencies as well. I would say these guys are like a little bit more radio friendly, like Toto or Ambrosia, that sort of thing. Um, but just as talented musical, I think, as all those bands. So Player is for me, this is the self-titled debut, but the, any other albums are really good. In fact, their, their subsequent albums are even more hard rock than the debut, I think. Player. Back to Chase. Nice, mm -hmm. nice pick, man. Everybody's nice. picked some pretty good stuff, man. I'm loving it, man. You know, uh, a lot of people miss these pop records, but they don't re they don't realize that the people who were playing on them were chosen because they're excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. So there's gonna be like top level musicianship no matter what, right? Yep, that's true. So, that's true. Yeah. All right. Well, my, my number two, you know, what's a like I said, I'm a big um big uh, um alternative rock fan, punk fan. Um this album is the last of three um, albums did when I'm done with um, the lead singer at the, um, of the band at the time. Um, what's a, none of the three albums did anything um, chart wise. Um, the band I'm talking about is Ultravox, the John Fox era, <clears throat> Systems of Romance. Uh, what's a, this album is extremely influential on the synth pop scene. And what's a, uh, what's a, when you listen to this album, this album basically was the blueprint for um, what's a, the gentleman from the cars, uh, Gary Newman. You know, he said that it, this album actually helped him come up with that album of replicas. You know, what's a, so this was the album, John Fox, what's a, um, Ultravox. This was the last album with John Fox on it and the album before Midge Ur, um, Uri um, um, went on to join with them. Uh, Midge Uri is Scottish, right? Yeah, Midge you're Scottish. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Scottish as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great album. What the, this album sounds nothing like the, um, anything the synth pop um, albums of Yenna and Rage and Eden and yeah, uh, Lament, Lament, forgive me. Um, what's a, this album right here uh, is a nice bridge between the harder uh, post punk band, uh, what's a kind of like a harder progressive sort what and punkish um david bowie and this album right here is that album right here systems of romance ultravox my number two yeah so midge also bad. had like a uh, brief cup of coffee with thin lizzy right i mean he, mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. i'm trying to remember who i think he did he step in after gary moore briefly after was, yeah right yeah or was it after brian robertson i don't remember it was only a couple months didn't last long but uh, it was after brian robertson Okay. And then um, what's I think Gary Newman, I mean, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Uh, Gary Moore had came by for like a little brief pit. And then then I think Brian had came back and that was the end of it there. But yeah, he didn't play with them that long. He found it very difficult. I can imagine. It's not really more a place where I would think he would fit mm -hmm. in well, right? Mm -hmm. Interesting yeah. with Ultravox because most fans of those early couple of albums completely disown the measure here mm -hmm. because they're so chalk and cheese, so mm -hmm. different. But then Majeure had a huge hand in so many massive synth hits mm -hmm. through the 80s. He was absolutely everywhere. And he's involved in lots of songs that you don't realise because he was just a writer here and there and helping out everything. He was absolutely everywhere up until kind of Band-Aid. Uh, and obviously that was ginormous too, but mm -hmm. more in a different sense. Cool. Mm -hmm. Take it. <clears throat> All right, Eric, what do you got? So this artist, I think it's more a guilty pleasure based on the label, um, the record label and the label of the music. Um, I know people call it new age and he's a Wyndham Hill artist, but 
This guy is phenomenal as far as I'm concerned. Michael Hedges, mm -hmm. uh, this is Aerial Boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, just basically solo acoustic guitar, but Hedges had all kinds of technique with hammer-ons and like Lewis had mentioned with the, I think it was Gabrielle and Rodrigo, a lot of percussive stuff going on with the guitar. I believe he was a, uh, it wasn't Juilliard, but I don't know what it is in Baltimore. I think where, whatever the school is in Baltimore, oh, he went Peabody. to. the Peabody, the Peabody, yeah. Um, but brilliant player. Um, unfortunately, he passed much too soon in a car accident. Um, but, you know, the new age label being on Wyndham Hill, I think a lot of people just wouldn't even give it the time of day. But if you're into guitar or acoustic guitar, he's fantastic. Oh, great. Check it out. Yeah, no, amazing player. Yep. Too soon. yep. All right, Rick, what do you got? Okay. Um, well, um, you know, as you do your homework and learning about rock and roll and music as you learn about Zeppelin and Stones and the Beatles, they covered a lot of people, right, from the people beforehand. And so, but the artist I'm about to mention um, isn't covered by any of these guys. So you had to, but they were around that time that made a big stamp. Um, it's no surprise to anybody that I would, if I love Led Zeppelin and, the, you know, uh, the Beatles and the Stones, that I might want to find out where they got the stuff. And of course, I got the Muddy Waters, the B.B. King, Otis Redding, Sam Cooke, Charles, uh, Ray Charles, all that. But nobody covered this man. And to me, it's one of the greatest showmen to have in during the 60s. To me, Steven Tyler took Mick Jagger and Jane Brown for his show. And that's what I like. Jane Brown, man, uh, live at the Apollo Theater or mm -hmm. just the 20 greatest hits. I get I get, I get, get hyper just like I was listening to Metallica because it's so <laughs> hyper and so exciting. Um, but it's funk and it's soul. It's not blues. Even though he does dab a little bit of R&B and blues, if you hear this show, he'll do that. But he started creating his own genre and he created his own rhythm. And he was just an amazing uh, front man. I love concerts, right? And I love uh, all my rock heroes of Mick Jagger and Roger Daltrey and all these people. But man... Steven Tyler's cool, but Jane Brown is it, man. That guy's mm -hmm. an amazing performer. And uh, and so I get charged when I, I hear his music. I feel good. Hi. You know, you got to love it. I get excited. So, again, nobody covered him because no one can pull it off, right? Uh, I think that's why some of the British invasion just left that alone. But he was coming up during the ranks of the Beatles, and Mick Jagger had to compete. In fact, Mick Jagger had to start performing when he had to follow an act like James Brown. So he really taught uh, the rock and rollers how to rock. Paul oh, Rogers well, well. and everybody out there had to learn from the guy like this. Steven Tyler, all that stuff when he goes, wah, 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 and all that scatting he does. James Brown was doing it in 1965. He was doing it way before there was the first album of uh, uh, Aerosmith. So uh, it's just amazing. People don't realize, but a lot of people took that state antic and made it rock and roll. Well, the, if you want to go any further, um, listen to the Who's first album. That's right. Listen. Yeah. Oh, yeah, true. <laughs> they did cover uh, Please, Please um, mm -hmm. and uh, okay. a few others. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I, I can't forget the, uh, the who were the mod, not the necessary rock and roller. Uh, so they did do uh, some James Brown. That's right. But you're right. And corrected. So many, and corrected. So many people have listed him as an influence, but yet he's not a widely covered artist. Mm -mm. No, that's right. And I well, forgot yeah, about yeah, the Who's first do all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good point. That's cool. He's a heavily sampled artist. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, but as far as like covering <laughs> time. stuff, yeah. yeah. <laughs> heavily sampled. Yeah. 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 There's only one James right Brown, on. people. Only one James Brown. Cool. That's right. That's right. Oh, some of the bass lines for those songs are just <sighs> old call classics. Mm. Like, if you really want to learn how to play bass, you need to learn some of those songs. You just have babies. To. Some of the first slapping was coming on there before but, funk yeah, made its own I, I trademark. Just the lines, just the lines. The, the, yeah. They're so funky and so the groove is so thick, you know? It's yeah. great. Cool. Right now. All right, Stephen, back to you. Well, I'm not on Facebook, but I have made a connection tonight. I'm beginning to think that Lewis is maybe the guy that started to follow me about in some of the videos <laughs> and comment underneath. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's the opinion of anyone who has kiss posters on their wall. So, especially for that chap, or chap S, whoever it may be, who does that, if they think having kiss posters on the wall is bad, 
You ain't seen nothing yet. You <laughs> seriously, obviously, you know. I've deep seen breaths, it. Deep breaths, because I'm going to talk about Lionel Richie. Okay. Oh, <laughs> love that album, man. <laughs> love that album. Wow, I really do. Okay. No. I don't have a lot. This is the only actual album I've got, but I do obviously have greatest hits with the Commodores, mm. and I've mm. seen them twice. Oh, man, oh man, what a showman! Mm. Do you know you want a rock and roll entrance? You don't need to go at anything else than a Lionel Richie show. Do you know he starts in the, in the dressing room? The camera falls on as he goes through. He whips the crowd into a frenzy. There's women with the tops up. I mean, Bon Jovi <laughs> have nothing on this. Absolutely nothing on this. And the camera falls. I mean, you see the cameraman come up the stairs in the middle of the stage, and here's Lionel, right on cue, straight into the vocal. Boom, we're off. Uproar. It's fantastic. Whether it's Brickhouse and, and, and a bit of funk, or whether he's seeing you, seeing me, it's just outstandingly good. And I love a bit of Lionel. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that, man. Nothing no, wrong. I love it. I like love it. That album, man. I got that, that one and the one app uh, before. Or, before it. Yeah, and before. After. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah, one. No two of albums. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just, um, that was a must like Purple Wayne at that time. That yeah. those are were standout records, and he's a great singer. My favorite song from him was uh, "Stuck Sing. on You." Oh, stuck. Song. That's a good one. But "Stuck on You," I love the guitar line, and you know he he. he um, even Kenny Rogers made that hit with Lady, and I was thinking before when I heard it, I go, yeah, that does sound like a Lonnie Richie tune, and I learned that he wrote it, but he wrote for a lot of people, folks. A lot of people don't know. That guy was a writing machine around that time. That well was not dry. He was writing for a lot of people at that period that you're talking about. Well, I, I've even been known to dance on the ceiling, okay? That's, <laughs> that's how in I am. And that song has the least enthusiastic enthusiasm you could ever hope to hear in your entire life. Right at the very start of that song, somebody actually goes, Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Go back, listen to that opening couple of bars, and that part is started with someone going, Woo! Yes. It's almost as bad as in the Empire Strikes Back when the first, you know, that, that, that shit leaves off, and everybody goes, <laughs> 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 oh man! <laughs> uh, I will say, and you know, another song I really love by him is "Running with the Night," and that yeah. you know, it's a great song. And then he unleashes that guy named Steve Lukather, right? Lukather. Who just yep. who plays on most of his albums, I think, if I'm not mistaken, right? I mean, he's got great session players on all of his yeah. albums. So, oh yeah, extra musicians. Yeah. And, and the band when he plays live are just off the scale. They're, they're yeah. ridiculously good and. All joking aside, he's a serious showman. I mean, yes, he's playing, playing stadiums and he's got the audience there. <laughs> Something to behold. Do you know, there's a lot of guys in massive bands that could learn a lot from a little bit of line. Yeah. yeah. I see him in Toronto, had yeah. everybody singing every lyric. It's like going to a Paul McCartney concert where <laughs> everybody knows every single word and you don't even hear the artist anymore because it's so uh, everybody's participating. It's amazing. Yeah. It's a special artist. Yep. No, it's say true. you say me. Every time they play that song, I get so pissed off listening to it on radio because they always cut the riffing part. You know, yeah. They always just skip past. I'm like, ah, please. <laughs> the best part. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Damn radio. <laughs> All right, George. Back to you. Uh, this one's a little obscure. It's uh, another alt rock band. <laughs> oh. That for you to say that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Look out, everybody. Local to my area. They're called Idea Men. The oh, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I love Idea Men. Mm -hmm. Fucking A. It's a high energy alt rock. Um, they blend in a lot of little pieces of other genres, too. I, I would say I hear some, some Muse, some Faith No More, maybe a little bit of Queen. They do they a lot of harmony they're pretty good. They remind me a lot of Mr. Bungle, but a little bit more toned in. Yeah, they're not that quirky. Uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say they're all that quirky, a little bit. They're more like Faith and More to me than Mr. Bungle. Um, yeah, the whole album's very, very good. This is third of four records. Um, the keyboard player does also some lead vocals. The, the vocals got kind of a little, uh, the lead guy kind of got like a college rock kind of thing that might put some people off, but uh, 
If you have any taste for alt rock, I 100% recommend checking this. Highly out. recommended. I am. Uh, uh, we we played we played a couple of shows with them with Sonus here in Chicago. They're 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 also really cool dudes. Oh yeah, yeah. Real fun. So <laughs> if you if you if you want to check them out, yeah, check them out. They they make great music and they're and they're nice guys to boot. So yeah. Cool. Cool. Uh, well, yeah. Ferraro's number two is Duran Duran, the wedding album. Uh, that's, yeah. good, that's a good album. Mm -hmm. That's a good album, man. Yeah. That's a good album. Mm -hmm. Cool. Never good heard. Album. He's got some oh, tricks up his sleeve, that mm -hmm. Ferraro guy. He does, yeah. 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 Good for him. Of course, he, could, he couldn't show up to say it himself, but he's got it. Uh, yeah, that's power. right. Well, that, that's, that's a different problem. That we were the, the time. I guess we didn't like it picked last time. So he said, that's it. You show him. Like everybody made fun of me for fly from here. And I'm not showing up next week. Some of you were going to pick. Of course they did. Mm -hmm. All right. So for the next one, I, 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 was, I couldn't make up my mind. Right. So I had originally gone with a guy who many people have heard in a variety of different contexts. You may have heard him leading Oingo Boingo. Oh, nice. You heard him, yes. doing, you know, soundtracks, the theme song for The Simpsons. But then I chose this album and, and I just realized that this is actually quite, quite proggy in many ways. Like this is something that I think that the, the people who like prog should listen to. I'm talking, of course, about Denny F. Elfman, his latest is called Big Mess. But I don't really think this fits the guilty pleasure at all because this is actually kind of as, as complex in some ways as the other one. So then I'm going to pivot to what the heart loves. And I'm going to go with Devo. Nice. I've, I absolutely fucking love Devo. And this record... Whip it, whip it Devo? Whip it, Devo. This is um, New Traditionalist. It's got Working in the Coal Mine and it's got my all-time favorite Devo song called Beautiful World. Yep, I love this band mm -hmm. and Mark Brothers, who also does a lot of cartoon music and other things. This is a great, great, great band. I um, it's easy to, to think they're stupid because they themselves convey that image, right? They wear the little pyramid hats and they're all like robots. They they, they have that whole shtick, but they're very good musicians and, and and the arrangements are really good. So I I've always loved them, you know, and um. Yeah, they were they're, they're kind of a joke band to many, but to me, then there's nothing funny about this. This is some no. good. Shit. Those so you can't forgive them. you can't forgive Kiss, but you can forgive Devo for Whip It. And you know why? Because Devo are why? not posers. Pardon? Devo are not posers. But they wear those hats and uh, their <laughs> yes. uniforms, and they're they posers. <laughs> they're musicians. <laughs> okay, I never heard anything more than Whip It, to be honest. So I can't really judge. So, oh, man. Uh, but I'm just most, saying. Most people haven't, Rick. Don't worry about it. Most people haven't. Back again. But I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I said it. Okay. I'm going right. to keep my, gonna keep my mouth shut. Tongue, and he wears a crazy hat. I've gotten <laughs> plenty of arguments in the comments with people about this. So. There's feelings, but I can't help it. It's like a visceral thing with me and Kiss. It's like, ah. <laughs> but I want to check out what that song called Beautiful People Buddy Beautiful World Oh Beautiful World thank you I'll check it out It's like synthy poppy but the lyrics are awesome And I just love it yeah. Freedom of Choice Freedom of Choice Mongoloid mm -hmm. So many Mongoloid. classic mm -hmm. tracks right? Nope. Many of them non-PC Because mm -hmm. they're from the 70s some of them, but Great stuff anyway yeah. All right and and by the way, Anthony, we miss having you here tonight. So uh, we we all we all love you. Anthony's got a heart of gold, and uh, um, you're the best man. Um, right so most folks who know me and have watched this channel know I'm not really a big fan of folk music. It doesn't really do much for me. I try, but you know. But there's this one guy who is uh, sort of a folk musician, but he incorporates pop music uh, and a little bit of rock and roll into his brand of folk i only just got into this guy a couple of years ago and he's actually really good he's a hell of a guitar player a really good singer and a really good arranger and uh i like the variety on a lot of his albums and i'm talking about uh, dan fogelberg 
the late oh. Dan Fogelberg. Yeah, and this is uh, his album Phoenix, which I believe was his biggest selling album. Mm-hmm. It's got his big hit Longer, but more importantly, there's a lot of really good music on here. A uh, good mix of acoustic and electric uh, guitar, lots of great pop hooks. Um, it's not too, too folky that it scares me off, but I think just the overall rich musicianship of him and the band is just is really great. And this is a really well-produced album from 1975. It's got the, the great title track, Gypsy Wind is awesome. Uh, mm-hmm. Tullamore Dew is on here, Beggar's Game, Along the Road. Really good album. I think if anybody who is like heard about this guy, Dan Fogelberg, all these years and maybe only knows uh, Longer, which was the, the big hit, uh, definitely We're experiment. All this What's that? We're all Lang Syne. Yeah, exactly. Another one. Yeah, another good one. Yeah. So uh, it's a really, really good musician, good vocalist, and uh, not too, too folky for me, which I kind of like about it. So Dan Fogelberg, Phoenix, that is my number two. Hmm. Surprised that you never gotten into any Richard Thompson. Mm-hmm. Yeah, never listened to him. Mm-hmm. Listened Phenomenal to him. guitarist. That's what I've great heard. Great musician, great composer. You know, what's a, he was um, just as much of a um, what's a, uh, I know that he um, cited Ian Anderson and Jethro Tull as an influence on him, but you know he was with Fairpoint Convention, and you know um, what's a, he became a superstar with that band. You know they were supposed to be this folky rock band that that um, covered nothing but birds and um, uh, Bob Dylan tunes, but they just out folked and out rocked them out of these bands that they were influenced by. Yeah, so I, I, I've tried. I've tried to get into some Fairpoint. I've tried to get into some Steel Eye Span. Mm-hmm. Just doesn't do a lot for me. I don't know what it is about me and like kind of folk music and, and just pure <laughs> acoustic stuff. I don't. I try, you know. I, I and I continue to. <laughs> what you You're mean? not even won over by David Pegg's bass stylings. Well, I mean, I liked him in Tall. I mean, he's a good bass yeah. player. I yeah, just very good know, the music player. itself. Well, I, I hear you though. I I'm not a big fair with, you know Fairport Convention guy. I don't doesn't do it for me either. But I understand. But I know so many people love them. So I, I keep I love a lot of times I'm like, geez, what am I missing? Right. That's, mm-hmm. I don't know. But you do like uh, Neil Young and Crosby Stewart and that's acoustic I, stuff. I do. Yeah, I do. And you'd like yeah. the ego, some of that stuff. You yeah. know, not for and, and I listen to Oregon. Right. And that's yeah. great. Thing. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So there's some stuff that I do dig. Um, but I think I like the for me, the folkier stuff that's got lots of good pop hooks and stuff. I kind of like that. I find like some of the Fairport Convention stuff and some of the Steel Eye Span stuff. It's just like, it's just kind of dense and it's not very accessible to me. I don't know. I don't know. It's these ears, I guess, are getting old and they just, you know, <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know what the deal is. I try. I sometimes feel like there's a limit to the tank. You need oh. to you need to let it drain a little bit and then you can start to absorb more. Yeah. Exactly. That's why it took me a decade, no, three decades to get into King's X. So there you have it. That's right. The, the, uh, the, you know, there's still hope for me yet, folks. So, you know. <laughs> you know, maybe one day you're going to see me with a star painted on my eye going, woo <laughs> But it's not going to be soon. <laughs> we'll keep working you we'll keep working you oh man we'll have george we'll have george sneak over to your place one night he's secretly gonna do a play like a uh, rock and roll over at really low volume yes. while you're sleeping and you're gonna wake up in the morning and you're like hmm meet, meet you in the ladies room where did i hear that right so, uh, i had a subliminal effect to me for for 15 years I didn't need to, to, to give it another chance later. But. There you go. Maybe All Anthony right. will start sending you Kiss albums and uh, you'll get an Elias uh, deluxe wow. package from him. <laughs> wow. If, if, if they gave me an Elias song played by Kiss, I would I would have a real, <laughs> real problem. That would be like my worst nightmare. In- <laughs> Early, <laughs> yep. Some Hello Rock City. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! All right, our number ones, uh, Chuck. All right, that for us. My number one is a band. You know, another band that I talk about very often. I tend to mention a couple of um, musicians from this band on every show. Um, it's from um, the band, um, the UK band, Japan. But this is their EP. Uh, what's this? This is a live EP that they that is now part of the Obscured Alternative, their second album which is their weakest album, but these four songs on the EP that constitute um, what's a, um, the rest of the album, um, the EP Live in Japan, is when you get to hear the band, what's so that the band that went from being uh, 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 Iggy Pop 
you know, David Bowie's um, Star, uh, Ziggy Stardust type of band with the first album to this. And this is where you get to hear Vic Karn as a bass player. You get to hear David Sylvian singing like a real singer and the rest of the band just smokes. It's worth it alone for just the song uh, Obscure Alternatives which sounds a million times better than the star, I mean, than the single, the, the studio version. But this, which my number one is Japan and the EP, Live in Japan, my number so one. What kind of genre? What, uh, so what kind of? Well, they were the precursor to the Duran Duran. If you like Duran Duran, they were 10 times better. Oh, okay. A million times better. Mm -hmm. What's a day? Because they were more progressive sounding than they were a pop band, and that's probably one of the main reasons why they could never make it big. And they broke up before they could even do anything here, you know. And they really never did well in in the UK either. But they were very big in in, in Asia, mm -hmm. like in Japan, you know, places like that. Japan EP live in Japan, off of the obscure alternatives. Those are the um outtakes i mean for the the add-ons onto that album i mean how the space player they were too too technical too mm -hmm. out there very much so mm -hmm. the, they, yeah, no, no, excellent no, band. Mm -hmm. great band mm -hmm. mick Karn is just a monster oh, oh yeah. he was a beast mm -hmm. yeah. but you know but they also underrate his um what's the drummer steve jansen you know steve jansen was just as brilliant of a um as a drummer himself and the most famous uh, musician of them all on there, at least from right now, within the proc circles, is the keyboard player, Rick, uh, Rick Barberi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who's now with Porcupine Tree, now that they're coming back with a new album sometime soon. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Early next year. Yep. yep. It's coming. It's coming. Cool. All right. Eric, you're number one. So my number one, it's kind of a cheat, but not. I've got kind of a double. But I heard Rick mention about, and I'm going back to the 70s again. So Rick mentioned before about, you know, when you're a kid, you get your allowance. For me, I spent it on records, but, you know, how many records could you buy on a $5 allowance or whatever, right? So you had to be choosy. So I just want to show this because this will go from Rick to Pete's love of Yacht Rock. I want to see who remembers these. The oh, yes. mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So they sound horrible, but I had a, I had a ton of these because they had 10 songs that were, you know, pop hits of that era. And I'm diving full into Yacht Rock for my number one. Um, but I had to show the k -tel because mm -hmm. that's just the way it goes. But I'm going with America. Mm -hmm. I only have greatest hits because those are the songs I want to hear. But again, great vocals. The acoustic guitar, oh, the um, guitar is awesome. really mm -hmm. cool playing on the acoustic guitar. And again, and it's just good pop tunes. Mm -hmm. So that's brother, my... brother, I got that greatest hit. And you know what? It was, it was almost like the lesson I learned from Pete's show about CTR. I had the greatest hit. Then he went and heard something on satellite radio and said, what is that? I had to go. And he went and bought more CTR. I did the same thing with the, uh, America. I bought a DVD of them playing live 75. And there's some cool deep track that I didn't hear. I went and got him. I got everything up to 1985. And I don't regret it. It's awesome. And George Martin, who did the Beatles album, did a lot of their producing. And I'm telling you guys, if you love that kind of music with if you like America, they're consistent all the way through the whole 70s. Just are only the hits that we hear, but they got more than that. I was impressed. Yeah, a lot, a lot of good deep tracks for that band, and, and the hits are amazing. I mean, uh, it's oh, yeah. funny you brought them up because I was going to include them as well, and I, I didn't have them on my original list, but literally before, like about 15 minutes before we started recording, uh, we were playing some music downstairs, having dinner, and uh, Ventura Highway came on. Beautiful, I love that song that you always, you always love think that. of. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's such a great song! I mean, great tunes, beautiful harmony. Yeah, the only reason why I wouldn't bring it up myself because I agree, I love that, but I think it's still rocking enough that it would be something that this channel would endorse to some degree because it's classic rock, but maybe not something that we would share in a prog seat, that's for sure. sure. Yeah, well, yeah. I, think, I do think it's cool, though. I'm, I'm glad you brought them up because if they never got love before on the channel, they got to be heard. Yeah. Well, like I said, you go through your collection and all of a sudden there's certain things that pop out, right? So right. 
angle guard and then it's america like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah between asia <laughs> exactly. right on cool. all right rick our center square what's your top okay shirt? well normally i wear the sot shirt right but this is kind of the hint uh, sun records um if it wasn't for this individual I would not be listening to rock and roll at all. And, but the reason why you might say, well, is that cheating? Cause it is rock and roll to some degree, but I like Elvis a lot enough that I even like the seventies stuff with all the concerts. And one of the biggest ones that I remember looking at a kid, cause my dad and my uncle would have it. Elvis was wearing like superhero costumes, man, he had the capes and everything. Oh, it was that's... cool for a small, uh, young kid. Cause I was in the comic book. This one used to be, um, uh 1970 february 1970 the month i was born so this the album was like oh i had to get this when i was a kid um but the madison square garden now see obviously you know the early uh elvis of the 50s i love that stuff where i got the box set and uh and he was like hard rock for that era i mean that guy can really rock i mean uh one night listen to one night or listen to uh hound dog and the sound quality of that time with a big deal. I discovered Elvis through my dad's record and eight tracks. That's about how old that was. But I still have I love for Elvis every time his birthday comes around or uh you know uh September when you I remember I remember the day he died. You know, I was only seven years old and I was already a fan back then. And in fact I cried when he died. So anyway, nobody talked about Elvis on this channel and I have to do that. He did a king. I went down to Graceland I, I went and uh, with what four or five years ago, went to Graceland and then I went to the, you know, Beale Street because I love my blues. And then I went to the uh, Martin Luther King spot where the Civil Rights Museum is there. It's a must see. And then you go way around the corner, there's a blues museum where all these great harmonica players and all my favorite players of the blues all exist. But guys, it was Elvis that got me even to know to get it all started. And uh, and so I just want to give a little pop because uh, I still listen to this guy every now and then. And um, and one thing about this, why this is odd, because, okay, Rick, you said you're not going to mention blues or rock. The guy does gospel and country and a few other things in the 70s concert. And I listen to it entirely. I don't normally buy country stuff, but I listen to Elvis country. I don't buy gospel stuff, but I listen to it if he's singing it. His voice is amazing. And I think it's his charisma. He stayed present. That got me wanting to be behind a microphone. And of course, then I discovered all kinds of other great people after that. Um, this was my uh, my hero. Right till I found out my dad had this record with an apple on it. And it just didn't know what that was. And I put it on there with the Beatles. And that took a whole new life of his own. But Elvis Presley, man. Sun Records. I was in the studio. Stood right in the floor where he's saying, that's all right, a mama. Uh, I was on the same microphone that the guy sang. <laughs> ah, sorry, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> Caught in a trap. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I just, just imagine. I can't get out. <laughs> just imagine had that guy um, had he toured the rest of the world. Uh, what's oh, I know. Remember, he never toured anywhere but United States. And that manager killed his career with the oh, movies man. and all that stuff. He took the art away from him. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate. Does yeah. everybody I even think what they were yeah. doing or where they were when Elvis died? Well, I also was seven as well. Um, what's it, um, in New York City at the time, what's it, we were just recovering from a tropical storm. And I have a great memory for stuff like that. I remember my father coming home with the newspaper um, later that day because he worked nights. And I remember him coming home with a, with a soggy paper and on the front of it, it said that the king is dead. And I remember that paper. With yeah. me, I was on my way home from my meme, which is grandma, uh, on the way home with my uncle. And he always had the eight track. So I'm hearing all these Elvis songs in a row. I said, you got the tape deck going on? Because Hound Dog and Don't Be Cruel is kicking in. He said, no, they've been playing Elvis a lot on, right now. And we didn't hear, know what was going on. Then the news came on right after, like when it's time for a commercial. Again, we are playing the tribute for the loss of Elvis Presley. 
And I'm on, like, we're on our way home to the Windsor, and I'm like so sad. And I was just crying on the way home. I couldn't believe it. I obviously, got, I always had this feeling that I would want to see him in concert. I've been hoping because I've been looking at those album covers for hours. But yeah, that's how I remember it. It was heard on the radio. And then we went, and I ran to my mom and dad and said, Dad, did you hear me? Go, they were waiting for me on the porch. They knew I would be bummed. Yeah, it was a weird day. I, I was uh, at the time it was summertime and I was staying yep. with my, uh, my aunt and uncle and cousins in Long Island for like a couple of weeks. My brother and I were, were staying out in Long Island and we went to see Star Wars during the day, an early afternoon uh, showing and driving back from the movie theater. They were playing a lot of Elvis on the radio. And then we got home and we turned on the TV and we heard that uh, he had passed away. So it's always weird. I always associate going to see Star Wars with the death of Elvis Presley. So it's same year. Yeah. Cool. All right, Stephen, your final pick of the day. Well, yeah, well, oh, that's, <laughs> that's an interesting start. It begins. <laughs> How do you follow the king? Um, <laughs> you know, we didn't have a huge amount of music in the house when I was young. So you got your music where you could get your music. Okay, we had a few cassettes. And they were quite good. We had the Beach Boys. We had the Magical Mystery Tour. Um, Goodbye, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. You know, decent albums. Good albums. Great albums. We didn't really play them an awful lot. They weren't around in the house. So if there's not music getting played in the house, where do you get your music? Where do you hear some stinging guitar work? Well, you hear it Damn. on Magnum PI. You hear it on the Rockford Files. Do you know, you hear it on, you hear some great brass on Quincy. And that, that is really the first music that I remember. So a guilty pleasure for me is to sit down and lose myself in a rabbit hole that involves things like the theme from Cheers. Because it's a great piece of music and I can sing you every word of this song. This is a Gary Portnoy version. It's not even the actual theme they used on the show. And it goes deeper than that because I've even got things like... Biker Mice from Mars, okay? Do we know who the singer is on Biker Mice from Mars? Anybody? No. It's mm -hmm. Jeff Scott Soto. That's who ah. the singer is mm -hmm. on Biker Mice from Mars. And man, oh man, does he give it big style. Seriously, <laughs> go listen to the theme tune for this cartoon. He's living every second of that song. And I, I can get lost for hours listening to television music, whether it's Quantum Leap, Hill Street Blues, that's a fantastic piece of music. Taxi, that's the most melancholy song you could possibly imagine. How do you close a ridiculous, ludicrous, funny show like Taxi with something that's so melancholy? I mean, come on, we all know all of these songs. This Marty is Miller. timeless music. Marty Miller's Miller. great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you've got guys like Mike Post. Mike posted the Rockford Files, Ellie Law, the A Team, Magnum, Quantum Leap, Hill Street Blues. There's Bill Conti. There's Cagney and Lacey for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on, the brass at the start of that is just ridiculously good. He did Dynasty, Falcon's Crest. That's a really good theme tune, by the way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then you've got people like Stu Phillips and Glenn Larson, and you can take in the Six Million Dollar Man, the Fall Guy. Knight Rider. Do, 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 do. Well, did you guys not have British TV shows? <laughs> <laughs> Every show is <laughs> yeah. <an> American show. <laughs> yeah, do. You know what? How well will things like Jamie and his magic torch go over? Because mm -hmm. okay, none of you guys know Jamie. Jamie. <laughs> Jamie and his magic torch. I mean, but honestly, that's rocking. It's like a mm -hmm. 70s glam rock piece of music. So uh, the UK stuff, I didn't really go into me. I can give you Minder if you want. I can sing all of the theme tunes <laughs> from the 70s and 80s. There's things though like Cities of Gold, Ulysses 33. I mean, these are cartoons that I think were European ones. And then they were reworked and they were given different kind of lyrics and things over here. But they were just phenomenal pieces of music. And I defy anybody, anybody to find me a better vocal harmony than the outro to, and this gives you the age of my kids, Bear mm. in the Big Blue House. Seriously, go and listen to that as Bear sings to Luna, okay? And listen to those vocal harmonies. If you're not moved, you're dead to me. Seriously. Giving us all a homework assignment. That's a homework <laughs> assignment, yes, absolutely. Yeah, and Bear will care how much you love him because he loves you too, all right? So that's, nice. that is my final choice. It's teasing nice. music. I can 
Well, there's a lot of good ones. I noticed how you didn't mention any Norman Lear shows. I mean, some one of the. I mean, how about the vocal the vocal harmonies to All in the Family, right? Carol O'Connor and Maureen Stapleton, or the way Glenn Miller plays. That's I mean, a great I'm show. Right. The hips all right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> what about Barney Miller? <laughs> Sanford and Son. Sanford and Son music was yeah, great. Sanford and Son with great rhythm. Yeah. Quincy Jones, right? There we go. Yeah, I, yeah. I Quincy there Jones. Jones I? Yeah. There you go. No, there was a distinct spot at nine o'clock, I think on a Thursday, where American shows were on. Okay. So my mum was out at Bingo. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we were allowed to stay up a little late. So I saw shows that we probably weren't allowed to see at that age. And these were the theme tunes. And it all stayed. The music was more important than the show to me. And I've got a collection of TV music and film music and things like that. And it's all just sheer, unadulterated nostalgia. I think it's a, it's a lost art because, I mean, not that I watch really any network television anymore, but even like cable shows. I mean, how many like of the, how many have soundtracks or theme, theme songs that are memorable that you even care about that's I think they're, they're eliminating that because people are always skipping the intro. And when you get a Netflix, you can skip the intro to go to the next. And so some of them say, why bother? So you get an FBI. They, ding, ding, yeah, the, the shows just start, right? Because we're yeah, that's, that's, we're living yeah. in like attention span theater. Uh, in that's a, right. World, yeah. right? So what, one of my pet hates now is that you'll be watching a show and somebody somewhere has tried to match a little bit of music to the end of the show. So it's maybe some, somebody's died or something, you know, tragic has happened or something uplifting has happened. And whoever's put that show together thought, you know what, we're going to change the outro music and we're going to maybe have a different arrangement or choose a different piece of music. And then the announcer comes on and goes, yes, and next, some guy flipping a pancake because you watched him eat a grasshopper. And you're just like, <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> I am. Um, I think you win the internet today, man. Seriously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually, I would like to also remark for people who are not aware. A few years ago, the Who released an album called "The Endless Wire," but a lot of people yeah. did it, just yeah. pooped yeah. it all over the place. There's a song there called "Mike Post Theme." Oh. Yeah, I think there's a yeah. very British yeah. love letter to that whole thing. You yeah. know that American. I mean, the the thing with Mike Post is you can like actually you can listen to his theme tunes and you can tell it's him. That's yeah. a guy who has an oeuvre, do you know? And as you say, Peter, it's a, it's, a, it's a lost art now. We don't really do that. People don't do bespoke music for TV. Promise, I will stop now. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. George is kidding. Cool. Lewis is kidding. <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. All right. Anthony would be very happy right now. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, George. Uh, George got a kitty too. Look at that. We got the we yeah, look at that. Chicago, all, all, all in place there. Here we go, left and right. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. My number one is an album literally everybody knows. Allison Beautiful. From sort the of live for that tour, man. The dreaded grunge genre. Mm -hmm. uh, this it's heavy. It's haunting. The vocal harmonies are some of the best ever laid down. Mm -hmm. It is. This this was on in a used record store I was in here in the suburbs. And I just walked right to the counter and said, give me this. It just, <laughs> right away, I just knew. I didn't have to hear any more of it. And that, that, that's the kind of way it is. Usually when something gets popular, it, it takes a lot of idiots to like it. So it ends up being not very good. But this time, everybody got it right. This is really mm -hmm. good. Not a bad song on there. No, no. I, I like the album before that too. I got both. Mm -hmm. I like the I, it definitely I, I has almost... the, the no softy stamp. There's <laughs> that's right. No softies on this thing. So that's the thing. It's, it's almost like it's it, it has that metal spirit. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Right. So that's is. I mean, that is just a stone cold classic. There, I, I, you know, I, yeah. I'll go out there and say that they were the best band to come out of that scene. Oh, I would, I would, I would second that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and that's that's arguably the best album to come out of that scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I do love Soundgarden. Well, they're the other ones, yeah. The, the, yeah. Those, to me, are the only two I can still listen to. Yeah, yeah. I would say Soundgarden was just slightly less consistent for me personally. Yeah. But I'll say yeah. they're outstandingly good, especially... Yeah, the they yeah, they were consistent. Yeah, I would agree. And they're still making really good records. Yeah, yeah. I like all the new ones, too. Yeah. Um, they're yeah. great in life, too. So good. 
Uh, Anthony has number one, Depeche Mode Violator. Beautiful. Yeah, that's great Beautiful. stuff. Well, I, I had a whole list of Depeche Mode that I just kept on to the side, but that's for another time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lewis, your last one. I, I, um, I can't choose. So I'm going to have to pick one, and hopefully there will be room for some honorable mentions. But um, Yes, look it up, right? Yes. <laughs> for me, um, I just love the debut by Tracy Chapman. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful, beautiful yep. record. And it's one album. of those records that's lived in my, in my psyche and in my mind for many, many years. And even though I don't really play music that sounds like this or, or you know, I've always loved it. And very mm -hmm. often, I, I, you know, sometimes when I have dreams that I'm playing with bands that are not my own, I very often think I'm playing in her band. Mm -hmm. And it's always in these weird places, like it's a theater but instead of seats and an audience, it's like a beach with the ocean. It's like really wow. weird, really weird <laughs> dreams that always involve her music. That's and the one with Fast Car on it, right, brother? Yes, it is. yes Fast yeah, Car. And um, yeah. Across the Lines. I mean, talk about political statements, right? Mm -hmm. But very yes. beautifully articulated. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, so I love this record. This is a truly a beautiful piece of art for me. I love it, you know, so. I like the other one. What's it called? New Beginning? Um, Something uh, with Give Me Another Reason, that blue tune that she does. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool, too. A couple of albums. If not that. now, then when. Mm -hmm. So many good songs. And and uh, unusual for the time, I think. You know, that some of the topics that she was singing about, I think, were very, very important. And mm -hmm. she just does them beautiful. So. I agree. Yeah. Cool. Sadly, she was just too political for major radio to, to really <laughs> take a hold of her. And so, but she was great. They played her on, on, on the big radio stations in Mexico all the time. Mm -hmm. Here in the, uh, in the States, Early on, right? Mexico. Yeah. Her, yeah. That album got a lot of play. Especially yeah, that one particular. Watching. I don't I don't really know. I haven't followed her, but she was very much front and center. And then Yeah, she kind of she made a big mark early on and then she just mm -hmm. like disappeared off the face of the earth. It's like, you know, that's yeah, but she, I mean, to me, there's like an old soul in a young body. Yeah, yeah. Songs, right? it's like yeah. A, why beyond the years, right? Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Just beautiful. I always got the impression when you're listening to her music, she kind of like bared everything in her music. The music is kind of sparse, but she gives you everything about her. Yeah. 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 So, I agree. Yeah. Cool. All right. My number one, uh, I had a couple here. I wasn't sure which one was going to be my number one, but I ultimately decided to go with this guy who I always liked. And I don't like everything he does, but I like a good chunk of his material. He's been around since the early 70s. He's still very active today. I find it really funny that as popular as this guy has been, I mean, he's an absolute legend. I find that every time I mention him on this channel, I get like so many people who just spew all sorts of hatred to this guy. But it just goes to show you how in this day and age, if you're a rock star, you should keep your mouth shut about mm -hmm. politics, right? Because oh. people could be fans of you since day one, but if you spew anything political, you're done. If you're, you know, especially if it's a fan who doesn't agree with what you're saying. Bruce Springsteen, uh, I just picked The Rising because it's one of my favorite albums of his for them from the last, mm -hmm. you know, 20, 20 years or so. But I love all his 70s stuff. I do like oh, a lot so of his cool. more recent music. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this is just pure Americana here. I don't listen to a lot of artists like him, but there's always something about him with the E Street Band, which is a dynamite group that I always like. They're great live. And again, I know a lot of people don't like him who watch this channel, and that's totally fine. Uh, I'm one of those guys that I don't really give a shit what your political viewpoints are, whether you're a friend, a family, or a, or, or a celebrity that I follow. I don't care if I like your art. That's all that matters to me. I don't listen mm -hmm. to the other stuff. So I have the ability to tune out whatever he says, whatever anybody else says. You know, it's, I do the same thing with Ted Nugent. Is he an asshole? Mm -hmm. Sure. But I don't listen to what he has to say. I just listen to his music. And so and I, I can kind of, you know, walk that line there. So, but I always dug this guy. Good singer, good songwriter, good guitar player, great band. A lot of great songs. So there you have it. See, all awesome, man. Mm -hmm. I'm a monster fan. So a lot of good picks here. So, uh, you know, this is what some of the 
artists that we listen to when we're not listening to the stuff we normally talk about here on this show. So uh, down below in the comments, uh, people chime in what some of your non-prog guilty pleasures are. Or if you don't like the guilty pleasures ter term, the stuff that doesn't really fit with what we talk about here. So that's it. There's because quite frankly, and Lewis said it perfectly, there is no shame in listening to any of this stuff. Music is music. Doesn't matter what the genre is. If you love it, you love it. And that's, you know, Guilty pleasure is just a term, you know, meant to say, not the stuff I normally listen to. And I don't normally talk about that. I listen to this, but I really like it a lot. That's so uh, put yours in the comments below and uh, we'll be checking them out and seeing what everybody comes up with. And uh, I want to check. Ch Chank, thank the crew. See that one beer, man. That's all it took. Thank the crew, <laughs> and, and it's late. Man. Well, it's not that late yet, but uh, uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, for doing their homework this week and uh, visit us on the web at www.seeatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, of course. We're here on YouTube all the damn time. All the damn time. All the damn time. So stay tuned for more stuff coming up. Please subscribe if you have not already and click on that notification bell. Very important. You don't want to miss any of our content. So stay tuned for more stuff from uh, these folks and everybody else that appears on SOT. For Chuck Alvarez, Eric Porter, Rick Labonte, Stephen Reed, Lewis Nasser, and George Lemie, I am Pete Pardo. And also for Anthony Ferrara, since he wasn't yeah, on the he been his list. That's what he mentioned. Good night, good night, everybody, and uh, happy birthday once again to the professional Ken, frog, sorry. Ken Golden. So mm -hmm. have a good night, everybody. Take care. Good night. Mm -hmm. Good night, guys. Sweet.